Hello, I'm Jeremy Vine, and this is Panorama. Tonight, what some Muslim children are learning here in Britain. That the Jews, they look like monkeys and pigs. Jews look like monkeys and pigs. Yeah. The Saudi textbooks for children that show how a thief's hands and feet are chopped off. The schools with connections to fundamentalism. Birthdays, all practices of the disbelievers and immoral people. This is what I call fundamentalism, reading scripture out of context. And the worrying gaps in the school inspection system. I'm clear that we cannot have anti-Semitic material of any kind being used in English schools. Ninety-five percent of all Muslim children attend non-faith state schools. However, a small but rapidly growing number are now being educated in either private or new state Muslim schools. But how much do we actually know about these schools? Do they help British Muslims integrate into mainstream life? Or do some of them actually encourage segregation? John Ware has been investigating. This is Al Khan School in Birmingham, the first Muslim state primary in Britain. Al Khan also has a private secondary school. In both schools, there's a genuine sense of respect for other faiths and cultures. We're here to provide young people with education which prepares them for society, tomorrow's society in which they can contribute positively. There are around 30,000 schools in Britain. Roughly a third have a link to faith. Just 160 are, like al Khan, Muslim faith schools, double the number a decade ago. Do you detect a greater demand for Muslim faith schools from parents? Yes, I would say so, definitely. I have seen the gr uh, demand grow over the years since I've been involved with, within the education system here. Research by Bristol University shows that of all faiths, Muslim children are the most segregated in Britain. al Khan, though, strives to connect to the mainstream. Within our own school, we have loads of different people from different backgrounds, and we go to places of worship, other places of worship. And in Birmingham, you have neighbours that are probably Asian, Christians, Jewish, different, so we all connect. We have an open-door policy which will encourage other people to see how we work and hope they can replicate this model. Pretty well all schools say they promote integration, but not all faith schools are as willing as al Khan to open their doors. So we searched the internet for evidence about how schools of all faiths approached integration. Some ultra-Orthodox Jewish schools seemed locked into their own world. A publication on the site of one evangelical Christian school condemned the entire religion of Islam. But it was the anti-Western tone of some Muslim school websites that was particularly striking. I think it's very difficult for politicians to actually be absolutely frank about this. There's some very good Muslim schools, but there's some Muslim schools that give me great cause for concern. That is often around the ethos of the school, the focus of the school, and a kind of ideology that is concerning. I've come to Leicester, one of the oldest Asian communities in Britain. This is the magnificent Jama Mosque. Founded in 1977, over the last three decades, the mosque has established several institutions. Next door is a private girls' secondary school. From age 11, the niqab is a compulsory part of the uniform. Across the street is another service provided in conjunction with the mosque. It offers religious rulings or fatwas for Muslims wanting to know what is and is not permissible in Islam. Some of the answers are pretty hard line. A female is encouraged to remain within the confines of her home as much as possible. 
she should not come out of the home without need and necessity. The fatwa service has decreed whether Muslim lawyers should help fellow Muslims seeking asylum in Britain from death by stoning. To assist and aid such people will be unacceptable, impermissible and highly sinful. The fatwa service also warns Muslims to avoid what's held to be one of the West's major corrupting influences, music. It says music is a direct ploy of the non-Muslims intended to undermine Islam. It also makes multiple references to non-Muslims, what they call the kuffar. The term kuffar is a Quranic term for non-believers, but especially for the enemies of Islam, those who are actually persecuting and torturing the early believers. It's a derogatory term in the context that it's used here. Well, well it's used out of context now. And this is what I call fundamentalism, reading scripture out of context. When the school inspector at Ofsted visited the girls' school, their report made no mention of the offensive language on the online fatwa service, even though both appeared to be part of the same organization, the mosque. Ofsted said, The school teaches girls to appreciate diversity and learn to value others' ideas and traditions. But did the inspector even know about the fatwa site? There's no clue in the Ofsted inspection report and Ofsted say they don't comment on individual reports. One former inspector believes it's just these sort of contradictions that need to be investigated. Once you get into the practice of school inspection, the starting point for investigating something is often two statements or two pieces of evidence that don't quite gel with each other. And two things not quite fitting are the starting point for you, I'd say, earning your pay as an inspector. So we asked the Imam of the mosque about the relationship between the school and the fatwa service. We got a reply to say that the school was independent of the fatwa service, which had no bearing on their principles and ethos. So we asked the school if the fatwa service was recommended reading for the girls. They wouldn't tell us if it was. What they did say was that the school did not, in fact, come under the supervision of the Imam of the mosque. And when we checked the mosque website, the link that said they did had disappeared. Do you think the school inspection system is geared up to spotting separatist ideologies? Well, no, it's not geared up to do things like that, partly because people haven't been thinking quickly enough, but mostly because it was never set up to do that. Well, there were different types of Christians. We found many examples of Muslim school websites having proclaimed their opposition to Western cultures and values. We need to defend our children from the forces of evil. Our children are exposed to a culture that is in opposition to almost everything Islam stands for. The curriculum must be kept within the bounds of Sharia. Even celebrating birthdays is condemned on websites some schools recommend. Boys and girls playing games together and blowing out candles is described as a major sin. Birthdays, it should be remembered, are the practices of disbelievers and immoral people. Some of the sternest warnings came from websites recommended by some Muslim seminaries the schools training the next generation of British imams. The websites say it's forbidden to watch films or television. They also say that non-Muslims should be forced to walk on the side if they're met on a pathway. And that to preserve Muslim modesty, places like swimming pools are to be avoided. They are in these schools from the age of, say, 13 or 14 for six years. They don't interact with uh, people who are not Muslim, they don't interact with the opposite sex, they, they, see, they don't learn all the ingredients of, of the Western world. So it's very easy again for them to read the medieval texts, you know, which, were, which were written at a time when Islam was under attack, and say, well, non-believers are our enemies and uh, we have to fight them. So what can happen when a medieval Islamic mindset fuses with modern-day divine ideology? They're on war mongering, they're on terrorism.
What's, what's terrorism mean? This is Sheikh Riyad al Haq. Some conservative minded Muslims revere him as one of Islam's leading lights, even though he has expressed contempt for non Muslims. Do not guide us to the path of those upon whom your anger and wrath descended, namely the Jews, and nor the path of those who went astray from the path, namely the Christians. He came out with some anti Semitic and uh, xenophobic comments, but they're actually not uncommon, unfortunately, in, in parts of the Muslim community. I mean, I myself went through a radical faith when I was younger. And I think the, the biggest reason for that is being excluded from the rest of society, not having an interaction with the other. Being on record as anti-Semitic and totally opposed to integration would rule out most people as a role model for school children. But it appears that Riyad al Hoq has been promoted as one. This is the Tuting Islamic Center. It's a place that Riyad al Haq knows well. He's been a frequent visitor, speaking here on five occasions in recent years. Some of those responsible for the Islamic Center also belong to an education trust that helps run two local Muslim state primaries, as well as a private secondary school, which is inside the center. On one of al Haq's visits to the center in 2008, Pupils from the Al Risala private secondary heard him speak at Friday prayers. The school newsletter praised him as an inspiring speaker, even though some of his speeches have been particularly divisive. Allah has warned us in the Quran do not befriend the Kuffar, do not align yourselves with the Kuffar. The verses are so many and so numerous, I can't recite every one of them. The schools say Mr. al Haq said nothing like this in front of the children, but his xenophobia had only recently been exposed by the Times. So why had al Risala invited a speaker so opposed to integration? They said they hadn't. So we sent them their newsletter, which clearly suggested they had. They then acknowledged... We now understand Mr. al Haq attended the Tooting Islamic Center in autumn 2008. However... The school continued to insist this meant the children had not heard him speak in the school, but in the Islamic Center. But how separate is the school from the Islamic Center? Well, they both share the same building. And some trustees of the Islamic Center are also trustees of the school. It is a free country. We believe in free speech. I mean, you can't really do anything to stop schools inviting people like Riyad al Hook if they want to, can you? You're absolutely right. But it seems to me that anyone who's running a school has a responsibility and a duty to ensure that they don't allow that school to be linked with those who have extremist or anti-integrationist views. al Salah schools say they are fully committed to community cohesion. The dangers of not being fully committed are profound. This was Oldham in the summer of 2001. Several northern towns were torn apart by riots as groups of young white and Asian communities fought each other and the police. The official inquiry confirmed the cause as segregation. By segregation, I'm not just talking about where people live, mm. but also uh, if they had a separate school, mm. uh, separate place of worship, separate work, uh, separate social and recreational facilities. The more segregated they were, in other words, the more they lived in parallel lives, the more insular they were, the more distrustful of others, the more fearful they were of outsiders or foreigners or people who weren't like themselves. The inquiry also said schools could provide the key to connecting communities. Education at its best helped to break down some of the insularity of the different communities. Where the school was very insular and based around one community and knew nothing of other communities, then it just simply reinforced the divisions in the wider community. Five years ago, Stanley Road Primary was 100% Asian. 
Today that's down to 89% and falling, a closer reflection of the catchment area's ethnic mix. The head knows all about the dangers of segregation. He was educated in apartheid era South Africa. One's early experiences do have an impact. Coming to live in Oldham all these years later and finding uh, you know, similar uh, patterns of uh, residential segregation. It would be a real shame if we were to sink into a voluntary form of apartheid here, you know, a word I thought had been abolished in 1994. Like the last government, the new coalition government is a keen supporter of faith schools. What will be the impact if parents are offered that option in Oldham? I think it will make what we're trying to do here uh, are much more difficult. It gives people the option to retreat into short-term certainties um, when actually what we need is a long-term view. Monitoring how schools promote cross-cultural harmony is the responsibility of the school inspection system. But in 2008, some Muslim and evangelical Christian schools were allowed to opt out of Ofsted and, in effect, become self-policing. They teamed up to form the Bridge Schools Inspectorate, or BSI. It emerged very quietly, and very few people knew that the new inspection sub subsystem, this independent bridge system, had been introduced. I think it was rather slipped through the system before uh, anyone noticed what had happened. But not before Ofsted warned that any inspectorate covering fewer than 350 schools of five different faiths and types might lack rigor and objectivity. The BSI has just two faiths and currently inspects only 70 schools. Those concerns were largely to do with independence and objectivity mm. and over time whether uh, a degree of familiarity or partiality might grow up uh, between inspectors and the schools that they were inspecting uh, if the numbers of schools were really quite small. She thought it might get too cosy. Yes. In other words. Yes, over time. One Muslim school that's chosen not to use the BSI is Birmingham's Al Khan, even though the head is chairman of the Association of Muslim Schools that helped set it up. So you're on the BSI governing board. But you don't use the BSI for inspectors? Well, the reason being we felt that, um, you know, Ofsted is a, is, is a body that we would wish to remain with. Because? Uh, because I think it is a government-recognised body, and BSI, we felt, we consulted our parents. There were some views that we had that it may not have the credibility, for example. In 2009, the BSI inspected this private Muslim school in Ilford called Apex Primary. The inspectors rated the school good or outstanding in most respects. But there was no mention of the school having given a platform to this man, Haitham Haddad. Mr. Haddad was guest speaker at a school fundraising dinner. Stridently anti-Western, he's known for his provocative speeches like this one available on the internet. I always say that the conflict between Islam and the enemies of Islam is an ongoing conflict and we should pay the price of this victory from our blood and Muslims are ready to do so. Apex School told us that such comments were not made at the fundraising dinner or the school and nor did they represent how the school teaches citizenship values. I'm not suggesting an inspector should be overly suspicious, but I am su suggesting that where <clears throat> they, they have um, evidence that some people associated with the school have in the past perhaps expressed extreme views of one sort or another, that, that, that they don't just simply, simply assume that because they said, well, no, we, we're not actually doing that anymore, that that's the case. The Bridge Schools Inspectorate told us that it's not in their remit to vet a school's fundraising speakers, and to suggest otherwise was bizarre. They also said Ofsted rated them as good, the highest grade possible. We're now looking at what we inherited in order to ensure that all independent inspectorates do their job properly. I'm clear 
but we need to be rigorous about ensuring that some of the concerns that have been raised, like the one that you raise now, are addressed by having a more rigorous regime overall. As the regime stands, however, there are some classes that completely escape inspection. Many children attend these classes in part-time schools, outside their normal education. We identified one such network with connections to Saudi Arabia, teaching about 5,000 children in over 40 weekend clubs and schools. Some are held in state primaries hired out for the weekend. We wanted to see for ourselves what was being taught. So we sent a young Saudi undercover to one of the schools on the pretext of collecting textbooks for his younger sister. They told him the textbooks came from London. So we followed the trail back to London. We traced the textbooks to this building in West London. Inside the building, there were boxes of books stacked everywhere. Our researcher was led to a storeroom where shelves were full of textbooks. He was told his sister would have to study everything in the book. The books turned out to be the official Saudi national curriculum. The ones we got were for 12 to 13 year olds. There is a hadith that says that the Jews were cursed by God. They also say here that the Jews, they look like monkeys and pigs. Jews look like monkeys and pigs. Yeah. It, it actually That's says so, yeah. that. That's what it means. Yeah. Other parts of the book ask children to list what it describes as the reprehensible qualities of the Jews. One Saudi now living in America grew up with the curriculum. The effect of these uh, textbooks on the minds of young people is, is tremendous. You have 12 years of education uh, uh, that teaches the student to hate uh, basically and practically everyone else, uh, be, be they Jews, Christians and uh, other Muslims, to uh, believe that the world is divided into two camps, uh, the camps of the Muslims uh, and the camps of uh, the other, the infidel, the enemy. Saudi officials often complain that these are Quranic passages taken out of their historical context. So we showed the lesson to an academic known internationally for his expertise on the Quran. Is it wise to draw the attention of children to these passages? I would do it, but I would spend a, you know, a long lesson talking around this. Right. To, to present it cold, as it seems to be here, mm -hmm. as just part, part, of, the part, of, the, yes, part of the teaching of Islam. Um, no, it's not wise. In the wrong hands, I think it, yes, I think it is ammunition for anti-Semitism. You could have a long theological argument in which you say that these things should be seen in a historic context. Fair enough, that's a matter for other countries. To my mind, it doesn't seem to me that this is the sort of material that uh, should be used in English schools. We obtained all 12 years of the curriculum being taught here in Britain. If there's any ambiguity about year eight, it's hard to see any for other years. Take this text for six-year-olds. So every religion other than blank, do they want to put the word Islam, is false. Whoever dies other than in Islam enters 
blank? The answer is fire, the fire, hellfire. In this book for 15-year-olds, they learn about Sharia law and its punishments. Thieves have a hand cut off for a first offence and a foot for a second. There are even diagrams showing children where the cuts must be made. For acts of gay sex, children are given a chilling message. The punishment, according to this book, is killing, execution, um, and it states the difference of opinion as to whether this should be done by stoning or burning with fire or throwing over a cliff. Also for 15-year-olds, the textbooks teach that Zionists want to establish world domination for Jews by inciting conflicts. I'm clear that we cannot have anti-Semitic material of any kind being used in English schools. This is not the first time that the Saudi school curriculum has been found in Britain. Three years ago, the BBC disclosed that offensive references to Jews were being taught in a different Saudi-run school. The material was removed and the Saudis also promised to clean up their curriculum. Not only have we eliminated what might be perceived as intolerance from all textbooks that were in our system, we have implemented a comprehensive internal revision and modernization plan. But not, it appears, comprehensive enough. This is the building we got the textbooks from. It's owned by the Saudi government. So we put our findings to the Saudi embassy. The embassy told us that the network of Saudi weekend schools had nothing to do with them. Nothing? These letters are from the embassy's own cultural bureau concerning the organization of the schools. The Saudi embassy also told us that anything taught in these weekend Saudi schools was, quote, not affiliated or endorsed by them. Really, what's taught in these weekend schools is the Saudi national curriculum, which is published by the Saudi Ministry of Education. And when we spoke to a director of the Saudi school network, he confirmed that the Saudi Cultural Bureau, which is part of the Saudi embassy, has authority over all Saudi part-time schools. Regulators are now looking at closing this inspection loophole. Ofsted are doing some work in this area. They'll be reporting to me shortly about how we can ensure that part-time provision is um, better registered and better inspected in the future. But will all these changes to the inspection regime be enough to ensure that British school children are no longer exposed to religious fundamentalism in the classroom? John Ware reporting there. Well, the government says it is worried that a lack of integration in schools could be radicalizing some young people, and it's planning to review the overall strategy on extremism to try and work out how to stop this from happening. There's more on this story on our website. Next week, in the run-up to the 2018 World Cup vote, we investigate FIFA. FIFA.